In this lesson, we'll continue our review of PSAT Reading Test 2, Section 1. We're now on the fourth passage out of five, and this is the Founding Documents passage. And just to review, I've mentioned this in the previous videos, every released PSAT and SAT, the dual passage, passage 1 and 2, has been on this topic, the Founding Documents or the Great Global Conversation. It's an archaic passage by two different authors, always persuasive. And on the same subject, but a different point of view. And I've always recommended reading passage one, only passage one, finding the questions that independently deal with that, and then reading two for the first time, finding the independent questions with two, and then compare and contrast. It's just a easier way to, to reduce these dual passages into one standalone passage. And so I assume you've read this. I'm just going to read the reference information. One is adapted from Henry David Thoreau. Resistance to Civil Government, published in 1849, so an old passage. Two is from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail in 1986. It's from his estate. And Thoreau wrote at a time when slavery was legal in the U.S. In 1963, King was arrested while protesting racial segregation in Birmingham, and he wrote this letter in jail. So just read one. I assume you've read it. I'm just going to skim over some of the relevant points and then answer only questions that deal with one. So Thoreau was arguing, must the citizen ever for a moment or at least in the least degree resign his conscience to the legislature? Why every man has a conscience then? I think we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law as much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. It is truly enough said that a corporation has no conscience, but a corporation of conscientious men is a corporation with conscience. And you see this word conscience several times in this opening paragraph. Thoreau is really advocating that men should follow their conscience. And he goes on later on to state that men who are purely following the government are really not, they're just, they're, they're just, um, sort of, I think, he, straw man, sort of like auto on an autopilot. They're not really following their conscience. And so that is the point that he's making. Let's find the questions that only independently deal with one. And they're usually in order. So the first one is 29. This is a word in context. What does command mean? So we're going to look at line 22. Try to predict it before looking at the answer so you don't get biased. So in line 22, such, let's read a little bit above just for context. This is where I was saying earlier, the wooden men can perhaps be manufactured that will serve the purpose well. Such command, no more respect than the men of straw or a lump of dirt. So he's talking about the men who purely follow the law, not their conscience. Such command, no more respect than men of straw or a lump of dirt. So these are not flattering um, comparisons. So command here, try to predict it such command i think it, it it really looking for a word like they're they're not even worthy of or they it doesn't need they don't even merit any more respect than men of straw or a lump of dirt so the answer for this one is deserve right they don't deserve they don't merit or be worthy of all right let's take a look at 29 or that was 29 30 and 31 always scan down see these two part questions throw makes which point about people who follow their conscience. So again, you can kind of know just from that's his position. So if they're following their conscience, then they're really acting according to their beliefs. And look for specific evidence. And there's the reference information here for the evidence here. And, and uh, I'm just going to scan down and show it to you. And I think it'll be a little bit easier. But you're looking for some specific evidence for men who follow their conscience. And toward the end of the passage, a very few men as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers in the great sense. And men serve the state with their conscience also, consciences also, and so necessarily resist it. For the most part, they are commonly treated as enemies. So here is that reference. The ones who serve the state, not just automatically like robots, but with their consciences, they for the most part, are treated by enemies. So that was the evidence there for 31. And it's 30 to 34. And how are they treated? So enemies, we're looking for some type of description. Remember, it's going to be paraphrased. They tend to have a mutually antagonistic relationship, right? This is just a synonym for enemy. So it's B. 
And let's take a look at question number 32. So now we're already on King's passage. So there are only three questions here that dealt with Thoreau. And 32, 33, and 34, these are all relating to King. And so this is when you want to read King's passage for the first time. But I'll just skim over in the beginning. He states that you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we are so diligently urged people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation of public schools, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. So here's the difference. Remember, one was really talking about men should follow their conscience. But King is saying that there are two types of laws. Obviously, men should follow the just laws, but disobey unjust laws, and they're not even laws at all. And so let's take a look at the first question relating to King's passage. According to an unjust statute, should not be. We already know this just from reading the beginning here, right? They, an unjust statute should not be. And we're looking for the evidence. So this is, you know, look at the, the lines or later on. So this is stated specifically later on in the passage. What should they do for an unjust statute? And I'm just going to go to the answer. And I think it makes it pretty clear here. So, oh no, that was actually the beginning of the passage. I was looking at the line numbers, but remember it starts at 40 because we already, it's counting the rows passage. And so the answer here is what I just read in 53 to 55. One has not only a legal, but more responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust and it's not even a law at all. So that's the evidence here, right here. Toward the end of that opening paragraph, it is 53 to 55. And an unjust statute, right? We just stated that it, it's not even a law at all. It has no moral authority. So it's A. And we'll do one last question on this page. Question 34 is a word in context. What does determine mean in line 57? So let's take a look at 57. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? So really, this is following up on the previous paragraph stating men should follow the just laws and disobey unjust laws they're not laws at all how do we distinguish between the two right how do we determine or distinguish let's look at the choices here how do we establish it's not regulate or direct or limit like how do we conclude or figure out or realize the answer is a